sometimes things just matter. Like when help needs to get there quickly, when problems need urgent solutions, when small things are a big deal, when your big dream is just one step from reality or new ways to grow are on the other side of the world, we know that behind every transaction is a purpose that matters. And it's why, together, we are making global finance move fast. With certainty. Wherever, whenever, and however it needs to go. For families, for economies, for all of us, for better. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth edition of Inside Innovation Live, a new series of shows where we delve into exciting innovations happening across financial services. I'm Nick Kerrigan, Head of Innovation at SWIFT, and in this session, we're going to be exploring CBDCs, which is a topic where we're very active at the moment, and in particular, delving into the topics of CBDC interoperability and access. And I can see this as a topic that's definitely high on the agendas of many people because we've already got 130 people that are joining us uh, live on the stream. And during the session, feel free to uh, ask your questions through the LinkedIn live stream and we'll endeavor to answer them as we, as we go through the session. I'm delighted to be joined today by Annika Kossa, Senior Economist at the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS. Annika, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Um, so, so to start the discussion going, um, maybe you could share a bit about your, your background and role at the BIS. Yes, happy to. Um, and thanks, thanks also for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure. So um, I'm a senior economist at the Secretariat of the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures at the BIS, and in short, CPMI. Um, and what I'm doing here, I'm conducting research um, on payments innovations, such as CBDCs, stable coins, uh, other crypto assets. Um, and another thing, I'm supporting the CPMI's Future of Payments Working Group. And this working group is a, is a group that consists of different central banks, but also the IMF, the World Bank, the Biz Innovation Hub. Um, and in this group, we explore and we assess all kinds of issues related to innovations in payments. And this was actually also the group that uh, put together and was responsible for the uh, interlinking report that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And uh, well, a little bit, my, maybe my Very background. Well, look. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah, background. I just want to say I've been in payments since the start of my career, the central bank in the Netherlands, then I moved to Canada and now I'm, uh, I'm at the, yeah, the BIS. Back to you. Great. Well, well, you, you have a wealth of experience in the in the payments uh, the payment space, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you on on the show today. Um, so, I mean, talking about CBDCs, I mean, we've been exploring CBDCs now for you know somewhere like like three years, right? First from a research perspective, and now more in an experimentation perspective. Um, but it seems that CBDC exploration has really accelerated significantly over the last 12 months. I mean, you, you've probably seen the Atlantic Council's tracker where they talk about now 105 countries um, exploring in some way a CBDC. Um, is this what you've also seen from, from your perspective? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so actually at the BIS, we've been surveying central banks uh, around the globe uh, on an annual basis since 2017. Um, and in the, the objective of that survey is really to understand the, the status of the CBDC work at central banks, uh, but also their motivations and their intentions to eventually issue a CBDC. And what we found in our latest edition, um, and in that latest edition, actually a record number of 81 central banks responded. Mm -hmm. What we saw from that one is that actually nine out of 10 central banks, they are exploring a CBDC um, and not only that, I mean, more than half of them, not only exploring, doing research, no, half of them are really developing a CBDC mm, mm. at this moment or running concrete pilots. So um, 
Yeah, I think it's really likely that we're very soon gonna gonna see more and more CBDCs really being issued um, in the foreseeable future. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, look, you, you know, I, I would agree with you. And it feels like that maybe over the last 12 months or so, a lot of the work has maybe shifted a bit from the sort of, you know, why or what, and more into sort of the how and design of, of, of CBDCs and um, some, you know, more sort of, you know, in-depth topics that are, that are, and explorations that have, have emerged. Um, you mentioned you're very active in the CPMI um, space. Um, maybe you could, for the audience, kind of give us a bit of an overview of the work of the CPMI to date, um, including CBDCs. And also, um, obviously, the BIS through the Innovation Hubs is, it has been doing a number of CBDC projects. So maybe you could just give a bit of a sort of uh, a tour of that. Yeah, no, happy to. So, um, yeah, so for those on the call um, who are less familiar with the work of the CPMI, let me start with a short explanation. So the CPMI, we are an international standard setter uh, to promote the safety and the efficiency of payment systems and also clearing and settlement arrangements. So really to make sure that everyone can pay safely whenever they want. Um, and the PFMIs, the Principles for Financial Market Infrastructures, uh, people might have heard about that, but th this is really a good example. So these are international standards that actually come from the CPMI. We developed them together with IOSCO. Mm -hmm. um, but we do more. Uh, we also serve as a forum for collaboration between central mm -hmm. banks um, in the area of payments. And um, since three, well, two, three years, um, improving cross-border payments has been really high on our agenda. So in 2020, the G20, they endorsed a very ambitious mm -hmm. program to really address the key challenges in cross-border payments. So people might know, like currently cross-border payments are slow, can be expensive, um, can be, well, not really transparent or difficult to, uh, to assess. So uh, under this G20 program, uh, which is structured along like 19 different measures, 19 different building blocks. 11 of them are led by the CPMI. Mm -hmm. So um, what we've been doing over the past few years, we've well published uh, various stock takes, various guidance as well uh, on, on how cross-border payments can be improved. Um, and it mm -hmm. can be done in different ways. Like we've, we've Publish reports on interlinking of payment systems, uh, extending, aligning operating hours, um, harmonization of standards. Uh, but we've also been looking at the potential of using uh, new uh, infrastructures for improving mm -hmm. cross-border payments, mm -hmm. like a CBDC. So, um, yeah, when it comes to a CBDC work, we very closely work together with the Biz Innovation Hub. Um, mm -hmm. So people might wonder what's then the difference, who is doing what. Um, so our perspective, CPMI, we are really looking at it from the policy perspective. Mm -hmm, so we're mm -hmm. uh, trying to get yeah, insight into the policy issues and discuss those. Mm -hmm, the Biz mm -hmm. Innovation Hub is more looking at it from the technological side. So they're really okay. experimenting and they're testing, really testing, working, building CBDCs to, 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 to see, are they, yeah, are they feasible? What are the implications? So, um, yeah, so, I mean, together uh, within the BIS, BIS, we actually, I think, really complement each other in the mm, work that we do mm. in the area of CBDCs. Mm, mm. That's a really interesting point. And I, I, I probably hadn't realized that, that fully as well, that you that there's like a policy kind of stream, if you like, and then a, a technical exploration stream. And obviously, you know, the, the two kind of are very, very highly, you know, complementary, I imagine, because you do yeah. bring different perspectives to to bear and, and important considerations there, right? Um, I mean, you know, I mean, the CBDC topic is so, so broad, right? Because you've got so, you know, everything from the biggest monetary policy kind of considerations through to some very kind of tangible kind of, you know, technical things. How are these systems actually going to work to work together? Um, how are we going to connect networks? Those kind of things. Um, so, so, so the, it seems like BIS is covering the full spectrum here. Um, one of the reasons, Annika, I was so keen to have you on, on this show is that, um, it, you know, the CPMI, BIS Innovation Hub, World Bank and IMF recently published a joint report 
to the G20 on access and interoperability for, for cross-border payments using CBDCs. Um, and personally, I found that really, um, really comprehensive and insightful, uh, insightful re report. And it was, was, you know, really kind of, you know, you know, went through the sort of the, the potential landscape of, of options uh, and, and analyze them. So maybe you could outline the main insights offered by the, by the paper, particularly around, um, I thought CBDC interoperability models would be a good good place to, to, to dive into. Yeah, no, let, let's start with that, with interoperability. So um, yeah, indeed, so the report, what it does, it identifies different ways in which uh, central banks can achieve interoperability between their CBDCs um, in such a way that it can be used for cross-border payments. And um, yeah, for this, actually, this slide really shows that in the report, we identified three high level ways of doing mm -hmm. that. So compatibility, interlinking and building a single shared system. So mm -hmm. let me very quickly go through through these. Um, so on the one hand, so on the, 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 the green, the green one, the green square, compatibility um, is really about uh, making system compatible with each other, making them be able to talk with each other through common standards or common data requirements. And this way of this form of, of interoperability, it would actually not really link systems, mm. but it would still, uh, because banks would still actually need to participate in multiple CBDC systems, mm -hmm. but at least it would reduce the operational burden on these banks to do so. So that's like really one step, one way. Secondly, mm -hmm. another, and it's more integrated way actually, is, is to interlink different systems. And by doing that, participants can transact with each other without necessarily uh, being part or being a member in each system. Mm -hmm. And um, so actually, in, if you look at the, 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 third, the third row, mm -hmm. there's three multiple ways or three ways to achieve uh, a link. It's either through a single access point, uh, through a technical bilateral links, or through a hub and spoke model, um, which is really using uh, a common hub, a common platform, which is connecting different different systems. Now, the far right uh, option um, is to build a single system. It's actually the most in integrated option for mm. central banks. Uh, to achieve uh, interoperability, but it would be really building one system, uh, potentially also having one single rulebook that would host multiple CBDCs. So it's actually not linking system, it's just mm -hmm. actually building one system that would accommodate different CBDCs. So, um, yeah, so what we actually also do in this report is we ex well assess, we analyze the implications and, and the, the implementation challenges of all these options and these models. And what we find is that indeed each model has different implications, for example, mm -hmm. on investment cost, on legal complexity, on central bank's ability to monitor capital flights, um, mm -hmm. the length of transaction chain. So, I think one of the key conclusions here is there will be trade-offs for central mm -hmm. banks. Um, the compatibility model, the one on the left, for example, it might not achieve the same level of efficiency gain or the same mm -hmm. level of scalability as a single system, but it's least costly to set up mm -hmm. in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's about trade-offs. Um, and I think here we conclude that depending on the situation of the country, depending on the needs of the countries, um, there is not one size fits all model. Mm. So countries mm. might in the end opt for different solutions or groups of countries might opt for different solutions and different models. Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting point. And obviously, you know, um, I think it's very valuable analysis. Equally, nobody has like a crystal ball to show the future on this. Um, and, and so I, I guess that's the, that's also what we've been looking at at Swift is at how can we solve for, for more than one model? Um, because, you know, we, we may need to be able to, to accommodate that. So, like, you know, for example, the first sets of experiments we did last year basically produced a solution for compatibility. Um, so we know that's a basic possibility, right? It can be done. Um, equally, I guess, I, I think your point about the efficiency benefits and here, what we actually then have done with through the experimentation this year is actually create a, an experimental solution around interlinking, trying to look for 
where can be the efficiency gains in terms of straight through processing, um, in terms of, uh, you know, you know, more straightforward adoption, um, and maybe even, you know, looking to solve some of the, through that, you know, potentially some of the pain points that people still perceive in cross-border pay payments, uh, payments today. You know, equally, there may be group countries or groups of countries that want to have more of that single system model. Um, uh, you know, having said that, I mean, you will have seen also like Project Dunbar, for example, in their March report concluded that it's probably more likely to be a, a regional platform than a global platform. And if it's a regional platform, then you still have to figure out how it connects to the rest of the world, I guess. Um, so did you did you analyze at that third level the interlinking type, type solutions? Were there any particular insights around those? Um, I think in, in this, the same conclusion, actually, it's, it's really about each, each model has different implications. Um, each model might, uh, might be easier to scale up mm -hmm. uh, than others. It might be maybe more, uh, more costly as well. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's, it's really about what's, what, what, what's the situation in the country? Mm -hmm. What is also the, the need for improved cross-border payments? Mm -hmm. I mean, that might not be the same for each country. Yes. Yeah. Um, it might also depend on who are the countries that you are sort of, that, that, that your inhabitants and your businesses are most, most often transacting with. What are these other, con other countries doing? Mm -hmm. So again, it's really about the, these trade-offs. Um, and, and finding really the best solution for for each each country, and so what what we do in this report again is it's not to come up with and to prescribe a certain model, mm, a mm. certain approach. Uh, we sort of present the options, we assess these options, um, and present it in sort of a menu form, so mm. that countries themselves can assess. Okay, you know this model might make sense more for for me and maybe for these corridors. Whereas others might might be better for maybe also for down the road, um, and uh, but I think in general, when it comes to compatibility, here we see, and you also already mentioned basic. I think that's 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 the default where we should start right, right. thinking from. Really, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. I, I look, I I I totally uh, I totally agree with with you on that. And then if we can achieve some kind of more interlinking solution, then there are potentially benefits that could be achieved. That although possibly also more more you know more complex more time consuming to actually to actually set set up i guess the other thing that we'll need to deal with is that as you rightly say d different countries are looking to achieve different things for CB from cbdc's and also looking at very different use cases across you know the spectrum of retail and wholesale so it means that you know that that th that if you're trying to solve different things then the, the, there's, a, there's multiple dimensions that need to be figured out in order to have them working cross-border, right? Yeah. Because you're not comparing apples with apples necessarily um, at that point. Yeah. So, but I think it's a great it's a great contribution to the report, and I, I, I found it very very useful. That the first times, first time authors were you know really pulling a, apart some of these implications at a at a deeper level. Now, the, the report also. Um, discusses access to CBDC networks and obviously access models are they're not a new challenge in payments it's something that we've been grasping with for, 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 for many many years um, how do you see the design options now open to uh, to central banks for for access to CBDCs uh, in, in particular and were there particular access, uh, insights about access models that you saw through the report yeah no I mean I I think when it comes to access, you're you're partly right. I mean, we see the, the same challenges, same models. But before I, I I'm actually diving into these models, um, what's new about CBDC is that we are also now talking about access to users. Mm. Um, mm. And here, central banks they actually need to ask themselves, okay, who can use, who can hold my CBDC? Mm. Um, so central banks, what it really comes down to, need to address a few questions. So first, who will be able to hold my CBDC and under mm. what condition? So mm. can, for mm. example, also non-residents use right. it? Or can it only be the uh, resident? Can it only be used by residents only? Or will uh, non-residents, for example, be subject to transaction limits or, mm. or fees? Um, so these are all a set of new questions for central banks to think about. 
Um, mm. And that's a really about access to consumers. Yep. Then the second area of questions is indeed about, okay, access to foreign PSPs or foreign banks. Mm. Mm. And here, yes, the options that central banks have are indeed pretty similar to the access options that we that they have nowadays with existing payment systems. Um, and I've grouped these three high-level models here on this slide. Um, so we have closed access, indirect access, and direct access. So very quickly, then the closed access model, uh, access would only be granted to domestic PSPs, or PSPs, yeah, payment service providers. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would imply that only domestic institutions can hold the CBDC, can use the CBDC. Um, but it does not mean that a CBDC cannot be used in a cross-border setting. Because even mm. in a closed access model, depending on what interoperability model is used, yeah. that we just talked about, yeah. still a CBDC can be used in a cross-border setting. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something to realize. Then in the second model, indirect access. So here... Foreign PSPs can access the, 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 the network, but only via a domestic intermediary. And, um, and the role of this domestic PSP can vary. And we also mm. see that today. I mean, it, it, they can, for example, be uh, responsible for sort of everything. So they right. might also be the ones acting on the ledger and doing all the transactions on behalf of the mm -hmm. foreign entity. But it might also be that uh, the domestic PSP is only responsible for the onboarding of this mm, PSP. Mm, so mm. that the foreign PSP actually can transact um, themselves on the ledger. So there's different variations and models possible within this indirect access uh, category, I would say. Um, and then third, there's um, central banks can use a direct access model. Um, and in that model, foreign PSPs, of course, subject to certain access criteria, they can hold and use the CBDC directly on the lecture in the system mm. without the need for any intermediary. Mm. Mm. Um, and yeah, again, in this report too, we, we assess all these models and each of these models, they have different implications. Mm. Um, mm. Because, you know, allowing for direct access, the one on the, on the far right, it would reduce the number of intermediaries mm. um, would shorten the transaction chain, for example, um, and that would could, that could bring down the cost of, of cross-border payments. But to implement a direct access model, yeah, might be challenging or more, more challenging um, yeah. because it would require mutual reliance between central banks um, when it comes to the supervision of these uh, right. foreign entities. So, so yeah, again, Different models, different trade-offs. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely, absolutely. And 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 actually, you know, I I'm presuming if you had to say a direct access model, that all that could have both supervisory implications and also potentially monetary policy implications, right? Where does your where does your CBDC end up? Does it end up in another jurisdiction? And is that something a central bank would want or not want? You know, there, there's big big questions there to be to be. Uh, to, to be sold for. I also really liked that was a really I thought that was a really important point about um, that even if you have a closed access model, you can still enable cross border payments, it just involves basically, uh, you need to have intermediaries there to be able to handle some of that. And certainly, certainly, we, that's what we've also seen in our experimentation is that even with a closed access model, cross border payments can be enabled. So um, there, you know, there's, there's interesting, interesting, you know, sort of interactions between the access model and the interoperability model. Um, interoperability, I mean, let, let's talk about that for a, a, a few minutes, right? Um, it seems that interoperability has really come up the agenda, both around, uh, you know, current payment systems and infrastructures, as well as with, with CBDCs. Um, and actually, that seems like it's going to be some, uh, you know, a kind of foundational principle for CBDCs that we have to ensure interoperability. Maybe, uh, maybe you could explain, Annika, wh why you think this is so important, why this has really risen up the agenda. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yes, so it's actually central banks, they, they do all share the notion that different types of money should exist together, coexist, and should be interoperable. So mm -hmm. that you know, we're going to have an ecosystem where we have CBDCs, we have bank notes, we have central bank balances, but also private monies, like right. commercial bank money, and maybe also other uh, forms of private money. Mm -hmm. um, 
And which is also what we have today, right? I mean, yes. we have commercial bank accounts and we have central bank issued cash. Right. And um, I think this interoperability between these different types of money is super important because it mm. would allow end users to, to seamlessly transact with each other, no mm. matter what type of money they use. Right. Um, and it's really important also to make sure that they are able to ex exchange the different types of money um, or redeem the different types of money at par. Right. Um, and again, that's what we see today. Like if mm. I go to an ATM and I withdraw commercial bank money from my account, uh, let's say 100 euros, I get cash, which is central bank money, mm. also for the same value, 100 euros. Mm. So this exchange at par is something that um, requires this, this, this interoperability between mm. the different systems and different types of money. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is this is really important. And also I think and for central banks, um, having these different forms of money coexist next to each other, it will allow also for uh, central banks to to maintain the, the, mon the, the monetary anchor that mm. they've been and that mm. they are mm. right now for the financial system. But at the same time, it will also foster competition, um, facilitate the adoption of CBDCs, uh, reduce fragmentation and efficiencies. Um, so, 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 yeah, I mean, I think interoperability is, is, is key in, in that mm. respect. Um, yeah. Yeah. And one thing also to note is that it's not only about interoperability between current systems, it's also really important that I think when it comes to CBDCs that they are designed in such a way that they are able to 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 um, maintain their of be able to also be interoperable in the future with mm. whatever monies we're gonna see in the future. That's or true. also depending on like whatever choices other countries are making in the yes. future. Yeah. So you know that having a flexible design, so design the CBDC in such a way that it is flexible to all mm. these changes, um, that's that that's really important um, mm. to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I I fully agree with you on 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 that point. And actually, yes, flexibility for the future, not only the current, is going to be is going to be be key. And um, you know, at a technical level, that that could be quite challenging, but I'm sure can be solved for. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so yes, um, but I'm I'm I, I personally am happy to see this focus on interoperability because here we're adding a new form of money. We're not replacing you know all existing forms of money with this and so there's got to be some way of working of, of working together and doing that in a relatively frictionless way um I'm, I'm conscious of time and we've actually had a flood of questions come through on the stream so for everybody watching thank you for sending sending those in so i'm going to take those uh i'm going to take the top three questions if i if i may and try and do them quite quite quickly annika um so um the first audience question, and thank you, Riyadh. Um, what will the impact of CBDCs be on commercial banks, in your view? Yeah, on commercial banks. So I think the models that uh, central banks have in mind, um, or the, the ecosystem that central banks have in mind, is, like I said, is one in which commercial bank money and CBDCs coexist. Mm. And what we've also found in the, in, the, in the survey that we've been doing, this annual survey I was talking about, is that central banks actually really foresee a role for commercial banks in this landscape mm. and also mm. in the provision of CBDCs. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it's not going to be that central banks are going to issue um, and directly interact with end users. So mm. they will very very likely do that together with commercial banks who work together. Yeah. The idea is not to crowd out commercial banks and mm. to outcompete uh, commercial bank money, um, but to make sure that they can work together and that the ecosystem and the CBDC ecosystem actually also um, um, is built on this collaboration with, with commercial banks. Mm. Mm. Um, so this intermediation is indeed uh, one of the of concerns, but one of the challenges and that's that's on the agenda of central banks, uh, and it's certainly something that they that they that they want to avoid. Um, mm. um, yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And I I think that's the kind of collaboration we're starting to see appearing. You know, certainly, for example, you know, in the CBDC sandbox that we're currently running, we've got sixteen central and commercial banks kind of all working together in that and trying to figure out how the system mm. in the future is going to function. So uh, I think that's a, that's a key point. 
Um, the second question we have was from is from Aaron. Um, thank you, Aaron, for your question. And, and Aaron asks: Many regional banks have integrated their payments rail with payment services providers from different markets. Um, and what will happen to those payment services providers if, there's, say, for example, a retail CBDC is 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 implemented? Um, so, I guess, what, how do you see that 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 role of PSPs and 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 PSPs across markets in the CBDC world? Yeah, well, I think I definitely see a role there for a potential role for for PSPs. Um, again, like it's central banks. Uh, I think many central banks are are not foreseeing a role for themselves in in providing services directly to consumers. Mm -hmm. um, so they really, uh, for, for in 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 their perspective, they see a CBDC as sort of the foundation of the financial mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. um, on top of which, PSPs, uh, banks, but again also non-bank PSPs can build solutions, can, can come up with uh, um, uh, products and services built on the CBDC, but offer mm -hmm. those to, to the clients. Mm -hmm. So at that level, the product level, I would say, mm -hmm. there would be competition uh, between PSPs, between banks, um, and, but there will certainly be room for them there to, to, to do their own thing and to do the thing that right. they are good at, right? Right, right. Um, so, so, and it can also be done, yeah, cross border, depending yeah. on, of course, again, on the access models and the distribution models chosen mm. by central banks. Mm. Um, this would be, yeah, possible domestically as well as cross borders. Mm. Very good, very good. We're almost out of time, but I did want to get to, to Gary's question. Um, uh, and Gary uh, asks about uh, the issue of personal data transition transmission in cross-border payments. So do you think CBDCs and their interoperability will have any impact on the transmission of personal data for payments? Um, I would see it, I would flip it the other way around. Um, it's as if it really depends on the design. Mm. and how the, the, the CBDC and the system is designed. Mm -hmm. So it's not mm -hmm. that the CBDC will have an impact on, it's actually the other way around. This whole issue of data sharing and, and yeah. privacy mm. is, is, um, is on, on the table and central banks are seriously thinking about that. Okay, how, what, how um, are we going to address that? And um, we, we, it might be that different countries have different different stances on that, and that mm -hmm. different countries design their CBDCs in different ways, mm -hmm. in that respect. But um, um, it, it's no matter what countries decide on on what kind of data to share, it might indeed lead to some challenges. Like mm -hmm. if you want to build uh, some interoperability or a single system, and uh, each country has different rules when it comes to data sharing. That might be challenging uh, yeah. to overcome, yes. um, and especially in in this interoperability session, uh, section, uh, uh, sphere. So um, it's it's it, it's one of the things to to consider that the central banks are thinking about, like how how are we going to address this, especially in a cross border setting. Yeah, yeah, and and having some minimum data standards to ensure that you know, say if you're if you're paying from one CBDC country's network to another, that you have the data required in the beneficiary network, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because there may be different requirements. So yeah, a lot more to be to be done on that. Um, Annika, the time has absolutely flown by on this on this com no. uh, conversation. Um, so, so before we, we, we wrap up, um, uh, do you have any key messages that you want to, uh, to leave the, for the audience to take away from this session? Key messages. So, I, yeah, I will probably say three things. So, clean slate. So, act now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, CBDCs, they are new for, for everyone. All the central banks are now building one. So, this is really the time uh, for them to incorporate cross-border features uh, into the design. Mm -hmm. So, that's what I mean with clean slate. Secondly, I think one size does not fit all. Like, like we said before, different models have different implications, mm. but countries also have different backgrounds, different situations. So um, we might see different solutions popping up in the future. Mm. And three, I think collaboration. Collaboration is really key. To really be a success, um, international cooperation, um, especially also since this clean slate argument, um, has an expiry date. I think it's it's really key that central banks get together right now, think about this 
access and interoperability at the beginning of the design work, really to avoid um, hurdles further down the road. Uh, because retrofitting uh, uh, systems to make them interoperable is more challenging than building it in and right from the start. Um, so, so yeah, I think these these are the three key things. I think CBDC's advantage compared to existing systems is clean slate, so we can build it in right now. Um, we, there's no single one size fits all uh, solution and and collaboration. Central banks need to collaborate. Um, not only between each other, but also with the private sector um, at an early stage. So, yeah, absolutely yeah. fantastic, fantastic messages, and uh, I absolutely agree with you on the importance of collaboration across, you know, any any kind of innovation that's happening across the the, the payments world. Um, thank you, Annika, for an absolutely uh, fascinating discussion. And we've had many, many more questions coming in on the stream. So, mm -hmm. thank you to the audience for for ask it, asking those. Um, we're out of time now, and in fact, we're over time, so we have to wrap here. But um, all that remains for me to say um, is to join us uh, next time on our fifth edition of, uh, of Inside Innovation Live. We'll be on uh, the Wednesday, the 16th of November, uh, and we'll be talking about blockchain and in particular the evolving use cases in financial services. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Thank you.